Welcome everyone uh, to the first in the series of HPC Tool Talks. My name is Marc-André Hermans from RWTH Aachen University. Um, I'll be talking about the Jupe benchmarking environment uh, today. As a motivation, the, the question why to use Jupe or like a benchmarking environment and uh, uh, first, I think it's important to understand that Jupe while um, emerging from a benchmarking system and actually is a workflow automation system. So you can automate benchmarking, but also any kind of performance measurements. Um, you can have automated software testing. Uh, personally, I'm a developer of the Scalaska uh, tool set and we have a test suite where we automate um, regression testing with, uh, with Jupe, where we basically um, do lots and lots of um, Scalaska analysis on given traces um, to see whether the change in the software actually still produces the same results. So those are all workflows that uh, you can automate using Jupe. One thing that I like about Jupe is that it automatically isolates individual steps in the workflow. That can be a hassle, um, there are some things uh, in, in uh, Jupe that try to help you in um, connecting the different sandboxes, but uh, the, um, oftentimes if you have several um, executions running in the same working directory, um, depending on the program that you're running, you might have things overwriting each other, uh, you, you might have like one instance is um, writing a checkpoint, another one is picking, uh, the, picking up the checkpoint. So uh, that sometimes makes it very hard to get consistent results uh, across runs. And so by default, um, Jube is isolating each step in the workflow in its own directory. So one thing that you'll notice is that Jube actually creates a lot of subdirectories uh, in your runs, run directory. So what Jube also does is uh, it helps you to parse the workflow output um, at some point automatically. You have to define uh, um, regular expression patterns that you can, once configured, will be automatically tracked um, or applied to the output of your workflow. So you can check uh, timings, you can check uh, verifications, things like that, um, that you can automatically then grab from the output of your workflow and put into a result table. Once you have those, all those things set up, it's pretty easy to extract the data either as a pretty printed table that's easy to view, like human readable, or you um, have a CSV table output uh, that you can easily either um, import into your favorite uh, spreadsheet or into GNU plot or into um, uh, PGF plots. Yeah, what, whatever uh, um, plotting software uh, you, um, you prefer, yeah, pandas and so on. Jupe itself is written in, in Python, um, um, but uh, so you need a working Python environment to execute it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's written in Python 3, but it's backwards compatible uh, with Python 2. Um, so it should be pretty easy to, to execute it uh, on any of the systems. It uses XML for the configuration in its newest version. It also um, uses uh, or um, uh, understands YAML as a configuration language. Personally, I haven't worked with a YAML interface. So all of the slides uh, and the configurations um, uh, that are presented here are uh, XML based. And um, so, uh, and, and finally, uh, Jube is freely available. It's, um, uh, uh, you can either download it directly via um, the website uh, in, uh, in Ulish, or you can install it via easy build and spec, the spec packet manager. 
um, to the easy build is maintained, you know, easy build configuration is maintained in, uh, by UNVish directly because they're also using uh, easy build as their uh, install backend. Um, the spec um, um, configuration um, I introduced, I'm not quite sure whether other people uh, maintained it in the past. So it could be that the, um, I have to update um, the spec definition to the newest, um, newest version. Yeah, so in principle, it's quite easy to, to uh, install. You just, uh, uh, like any uh, Python software, you download it um, and uh, execute setup pi, and basically the rest is automated. So then, um, as I said, Jube is a workflow management um, software. And uh, so the, the basic way of running a, a, your workflow is you initiate your workflow that you have previously defined, which is known as running. So jupe run would start workflow. And then it either continues directly to the end and everything is done, or you have some steps that, are, um, that will have to finish asynchronously. And that means that you then can continue your workflow, and uh, wh even while your workflow is not uh, fully complete, you can already start analyzing the parts that are completed, and you can uh, generate a partial result table, and you would continue until the full workflow is complete. And at that point, you would have the final analysis uh, of your output and uh, uh, the final table and the final output. To each of those steps that are in the workflow before you have a command, um, you can, uh, if you, the, the first, the starting of your workflow would be jupe run. Uh, you have a jupe specification, which is the configuration file. And that is the, the main uh, configuration file that is, that is here. Um, jupe supports the uh, inclusion of different um, um, other configurations. Uh, and that helps you if you have definitions that um, are uh, that you want to reuse at some point. So you don't have to put everything in one file, but you can basically insert uh, things and include things from uh, external files as well. In principle, you can also have multiple benchmark definitions inside one uh, Jupe specification. Uh, although uh, the the introduction in this. Uh, presentation here only focuses on a single benchmark. Uh, then you can tag um, uh, your, uh, your run and we'll see how to use tags to individualize different settings. Yeah? Um, so you can basically, um, you can specify different values for uh, variables in your Jupe specification and then make them accessible uh, through different tags. So what you run does is you, um, uh, you start a new measurement and that means in uh, the measurement out path, what that is, we'll uh, learn in a minute um, when we actually dive into the configuration part, uh, it creates a new run directory and then that gets a specific ID. Um, usually the, the next ID that's available or if, uh, as you can see with Jube Run, you can also provide an ID uh, that you can uh, um, uh, with then use. Yeah, the, um, what you need to understand in terms of the, the workflow management is that the Jube spec um, contains the full benchmark specification and it'll, um, uh, Jube will read this, the complete workflow um, definition when you start your run, and then you can't change the um, the like dependencies between different steps and so on. So the workflow itself is fixed after you did a, a jupe run. Um, although different variables inside the workflow um, might actually uh, still be flexible during the run and depend on different steps. 
But what you can do is uh, the configuration, which is usually the part of the same JUB specification, the configuration for the analysis and the resulting. So the regular expression patterns and um, the, the tables that you want to generate, either CSV or pretty printed, those you can update. So you can, once you have your, your workflow, um, you're done, you can basically run it through once and then generate the, uh, the, you look at the output that you have, generate your regular expression patterns, and you don't have to remeasure everything. You can update the regular expressions until they fit, until they match what you want to read, and then place them into the tables. The, the next step in the workflow, um, as I showed it, is that you continue something. There's something uh, called an um, uh, like asynchronous um, do expressions that basically they're done, but Jube or they are executed, but Jube does not um, wait for uh, for the completion of that. So it's basically it started with an ampersand, right? So, but then um, Jube knows that it kind of has to wait for some uh, some form of feedback that this execution that this uh, um, additional directive uh, is finished. So uh, it waits for a so-called done file to be generated. So whenever you um, place something as an uh, or configure something as an um, uh, asynchronous directive, whatever you have needs to generate this done file that you configure you to wait for. So, and with this, you basically have the outside control of that your workflow keeps working or keeps getting uh, um, or keeps uh, being progressed until it is done. And then you would uh, then analyze the output with Jube Analyze. And uh, there, um, you already have the same, same uh, description here with the continue. You have that basically the out path, which is the base directory of where your runs, the run directories are done. And then you select which jupe runs you want to progress uh, by selecting an ID, yeah, at least one, but you can also have multiple IDs and progress that. So you can basically start multiple workflows and have them being uh, progressed um, uh, concurrently, um, if you will. So as I said, the anal uh, analysis part uses the, um, or applies the regular expression search patterns to the output that your application generates. Um, and uh, then it stores the information that you configured. And uh, then with a the result step, it generates the output that you, that you have configured. And the output um, is then, um, uh, either a pretty printed table or um, uh, or a CSV file. So one one nice thing about the um, the result part here is you can, as as I said, you can also provide a dash dash update, and this the file would be the Jupe specification, the updated Jupe spe uh, specification, and. Um, uh, you can also say, well, of course, with the updated JUPE specification, you need to reanalyze everything. You know? So um, if, you would, if you changed, uh, for example, a regular expression pattern because it didn't match the output as it should, um, you would fix that. Then you, you can do JUPE result dash A dash U, your JUPE specification, outpath dash dash I, uh, ID with your number. And then you should also um, and th that is something that you have to do manually, uh, add the tags that you, um, uh, that you applied originally. Otherwise, that information uh, might get lost in the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the run configuration. Okay, so after having talked about the, the general workflow of doing jupe run, jupe continue until it's done, jupe analyze, jupe result, let's have a look at how the jupe specification, the, the uh, benchmark specification 
um, and the files are shaped. As I said, you can use either XML or YAML. All the examples here are based on XML because the, uh, the slide deck also uh, predates uh, Jube's ability to understand YAML. So um, the, uh, the basic um, or the, the outermost XML tag that uh, you need to use in a file that you want to include or and be parsed by jupe has to have the jupe tag. So it will be jupe um, and slash jupe at the very end. And only everything that's in between those gets regarded by, uh, by jupe. So in such a jupe tag, you would then define your benchmark and the benchmark tag has two attributes, a name of your uh, benchmark. Um, and there you should, um, uh, it, uh, you should remember not to, the name should not contain any white space. It's not a specific problem of the, uh, of Jupe itself. So Jupe will happily um, uh, uh, work with white space in the name. However, uh, some predefined variables use the name and uh, insert that as part of for example, file names and, and things like that. And uh, if you, for example, if you're using Slurm and um, uh, so the benchmark name will be part of your job name and Slurm doesn't like white space in the job name. So that's where you then uh, run into trouble uh, if your benchmark name contains white space. So um, rule of thumb from my side would be just use an underscore uh, if you want to uh, or camel case or whatever to um, eliminate any white space in your name. And then there's the out path. The, I, I said the, um, that is the, the base path for your runs. If you start multiple runs, you'll have um, uh, different runs sitting in that directory next to each other. And what you can do there is uh, you can use envir environment variables. And that's usually something that I uh, use myself as well, because that means I can easily uh, by, without modifying my, my Jupe configuration, I can influence whether my run directory is in my home, is on work, is on HPC work, is on wherever I want to place it. I just need to um, export it to a different, um, uh, the export the variable to a different path. So then you can also um, add a comment to the benchmark. Um, and that is, uh, I would usually recommend a descriptive text for the benchmark. Uh, it, it is not uh, mandatory, so, um, and, uh, but it is shown when you, uh, when you call jupe info, which is an additional command. Um, and that helps you to basically get rid, oh, or not get rid, helps you to track the, um, and identify different benchmarks in your, um, uh, in your run, in your out path, yeah? And differentiate those. So for example, if you, um, uh, there's also the command jupe comment where you can augment the existing comment. And then um, you would, uh, for example, if you have a measurement that you used for certain publications, you can say jupe comment and add that this measurement was, was uh, used in this and this publication. For example, it's just an application um, of how to use the comment feature. So with, with those, the, the basic um, jupe configuration file is uh, as you see it at the moment, you have the, the jupe tags um, on the outside, you have the benchmark here, we name it hello world, and we have an out path where we say it's dollar jupe um, slash uh, jupe slash hello world. Yeah, I usually, uh, because I, um, this is kind of like a base directory uh, for me, and I usually kind of encode uh, a special subdirectory for the benchmark that I have. So because then uh, underneath the hello world directory, you would have the 
zero, one, two, three, and so on to continue um, uh, to continue uh, counting. But all the runs there would be the same application, would be the same benchmark. Yeah. But how you organize that is kind of your uh, is on your own, and uh, Jupe is flexible enough uh, flexible enough to uh, work that out. Right. So. Inside, yeah, as I um, have a comment here, place the benchmark definition here. Um, uh, in there, you place additional tags. And uh, uh, first and foremost um, uh, set of tasks is the parameter set, which contains the set of parameter tags. And parameters um, are any variables or static information that you want to uh, use to configure your um, uh, your workflow, yeah. Um, so it can be static in the in the sense that you set it to a specific variable uh, or a specific value, um, but it can also be dynamic in the sense that you um, uh, influence the value that you, the uh, that you set by using tags. And it can be completely dynamic in the sense that it parses your environment and executes shell commands, Python commands, Perl commands to set uh, a certain parameter to uh, a specific value. Yeah. Um, all the parameters in one set are evaluated, uh, evaluated the first time the parameter set is used. Yeah. Um, how that is done, uh, we'll also see uh, in the uh, remainder of the talk when we actually look at specific uh, configurations. Yeah. Um, so you use them in a certain step, then the whole parameter set gets evaluated, and then the step is executed, and then you basically the next step in your workflow will be um, uh, continued. And um, so the question of what can you or what should you put into one parameter set, it depends on the the, the time on when it should be evaluated. Yeah, so I usually put build variables into one parameter set and run variables into one particular set. And um, uh, because then I have different steps in my workflow and then use them one at a time. Because at some point uh, a run uh, parameter might depend on the, on, uh, or might not be um, available during the uh, during the um, the build process, but only during the run process. So I can't evaluate uh, everything right up front. So the parameter sets themselves; these are basically variables that carry a value. But it's um, you can reevaluate it, but it's uh, also more part of the advanced features of a parameter. You should rather think of parameters as constants that you, you initiate once and then they're available with that value for the rest of um, your workflow. There are um, ways to re-evaluate a parameter, um, but that is something that is a more advanced use and we won't cover that here. Um, as I said, the parameters can be set explicitly or you can compute them by some form of an expression, shell put, Perl or Python. And uh, then those are basically the variables of your uh, in your configuration. And then you have the steps that with their dependencies form the workflow of things that you want to do. And each step can contain um, multiple so-called do tags, which are commands, you know, just shell commands that are um, uh, given to the uh, to the shell and they're just basically executed. Um, and uh, so you can do a make dir in them, but you can also, for example, do an as batch command to send something to the batch system. Um, so you define your workflow via dependencies among the steps. Um, the, the kinds of workflows that you can define with that are. Uh, limited in the sense that you can you cannot have arbitrary um, dependencies, 
and uh, currently Jupe does not um, uh, does not support things like like global barriers in your tasks. For that, um, there's also uh, work with uh, uh, colleagues of mine where we have multiple um, layers of Jupe. Uh, workflows triggering other Jupe workflows and then basically implementing something like that um, uh, as a workaround. But uh, in, in principle, you should think this as as a um, as a tree, and each path in the tree is only dependent on its parent and independent of any siblings or um, uh, other uh, other steps in the system. So um, then that is the workflow. And then you have so-called pattern sets. And the pattern sets, similar to the parameter sets, they contain sets of patterns. Um, and these patterns are, for example, reg regular expressions to parse specific output or, um, uh, or like standard output, your job output, or files that you generated. Um, in there. So you can, in your workflow, you can also have a do step that uh, runs after your, your, your job execution and that outputs data to some file, then you can, um, uh, you can configure Jupe to parse that file and apply a certain uh, pattern set. The pattern set is used by the analyzer, just like the parameter set is used um, by a step. So match patterns are usable, usable then as columns in the result output. So if when you define your table, you can um, use uh, your parameters, any parameter that you um, uh, have configured and any pattern as a column in your table. The analyzer then basically relates the pattern sets to the output files, and there you define uh, like which pattern set to apply to which file, or which pattern set to apply globally to any file that you uh, define. And we'll look at the details of what you, uh, what you can do there um, as well uh, uh, in the coming slides. So, and then finally, you have a result. Um, table that contains a set of output definition of table definitions that can either be pretty printed um, or CSV output. And there you define your columns um, and then that is basically written, written out. So that is basically an overview of the main tags that you, uh, that you have in your configuration. And uh, so as this course is uh, called Jupe by example, uh, my idea is to jump right uh, in and actually create um, uh, a benchmark configuration for Jupe for uh, something for a code that is um, uh, hopefully known to, to most of you um, is the, uh, for example, here, the NAS parallel benchmarks. It's a freely available benchmark suite. Um, I don't want to go into uh, much detail on whether it's uh, good to actually benchmark systems with that benchmark C now, or whether you should have additional codes or other completely other codes. Um, we use it uh, in our uh, team for Scopin Skalaska uh, often as, um, as an example code because um, it's easy to build, easy to, uh, to execute and um, uh, you, yeah, you can show show how tools work with that. Uh, so um, uh, we have been working with that uh, for quite some time. So the Nespero benchmarks, they define different application kernels um, uh, that like a CG solver, MG is a multigrid, and oh, um, I have a slight glitch in the, in the um, uh, in the slide deck there, that there's the BT benchmark, which also has an IO variant or um, has different IO variants um, that you can run with from simple IO to heavy IO, and uh, you have different other benchmarks. And um, the BT benchmark is actually what we're going to look at, and what the uh, the the common um, what the Nespero benchmarks have in their 
benchmark definitions is that uh, it provides all the make files for the benchmarks and has a common compiler settings and library settings file in a config uh, directory called make.dev. Uh, so the, where I would start with, I want to automate running BT is I will have to create the, um, the make.dev for the configuration that I want to run in. So for that, I said um, one of the basic building blocks is a parameter set. So um, we uh, uh, would define a parameter set that I here um, call config um, make dev p set has lots of um, uh, let's say uh, my personal best practices. I usually put things in the name um, uh, the step I first use it in. So I would later define config step. So this would be the config. And uh, it is the make def um, uh, parameter set and the p set I usually use as a suffix. But you can you can name them um, however you want. It's just my personal preference to have some form of system so it's easy to actually to understand while reading the, the rest of the configuration whether I actually uh, when I included or used something whether I used all the right things and whether I have my P sets and or parameter sets and uh, different kinds of sets as well. So what I define here is um, the MPIC compiler and the Fortran compiler because uh, the nest pair benchmarks, most of them are in Fortran. Um, uh, I think one is in C. So the, the make.dev defines uh, that. And here I put uh, uh, MPICC as a static variable in there. Um, and uh, I also parse the vendor um, as, uh, as a shell command out where I execute um, whatever is stored in the MPIC compiler parameter, do dash dash version and just parse and store the, the headline. And that kind of works for um, uh, Intel uh, and, um, uh, and OpenMPI quite well. Um, if I would use some other MPI, I would have to double check whether this line actually does um, what it's supposed to. Then you have additional parameters like C flags, C link flags, which I set to specific values. Um, but for example, you could also um, define different optimization levels if you want to run this benchmark in different uh, configurations. That is also something that we'll see on how to do that later on. So any of the parameters you can, uh, as I said, um, set explicitly or evaluate um, just as you see fit. Yeah? And for Fortran, you have the same, um, the same type of uh, configurations. So, and then um, I usually uh, create a template file that is the, the, the source for the make.dev that I want to generate. And that, um, uh, that uh, template file that contains placeholders and uh, also by convention, most of the placeholders, um, I think that's, that's legacy. Uh, you could define whatever pattern you want to replace. You just need to make sure that you don't have this pattern in any place else where you don't want, uh, want it replaced. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, by convention, um, your, uh, the patterns that I define and that uh, the patterns that are pre that ship predefined with Jube, they have a hash, whatever your um, uh, substitution pattern is hash again, uh, and then that is be re replaced. And you can configure what is replaced in, um, with uh, later in a so-called substitution set. So. There's the uh, make.dev done in for the input to a template file. And I usually place that in the, uh, for, for, for this year in the config directory. So I know where it is and I can later pick it up, generate content um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, basically have a well-known place where to put it. 
So as I said, you have Fortran uh, definitions, you have C definitions, and that is for this example, everything that I, I said. Of course, you could basically go through the whole list of things in this template um, and configure that with, um, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with Jew, but usually I tend to, to um, go by the minimal approach and start uh, using a template or a, a variable for something, if I say, I want to vary that, um, uh, that, that part of the build, that part of the workflow, then I generate um, uh, something there. All right, so then when we have this template, uh, we have to define a so-called file set for you to know where to uh, look this, um, uh, where to look this up, where to find it, yeah. And as I said, I often like for this benchmark, I put it into the config directory. I sometimes uh, um, have a separate template directory in in uh, my definitions, and there I put the templates. Um, it's all configurable on and personal taste. What you see here is the Jew benchmark home directory. That's uh, it's one of several predefined. Um, uh, variables, and, and you can look into the Jupe tutorial that's on the web, which is basically the documentation for Jupe, and there see uh, several other um, uh, variables defined, and uh, the Jupe benchmark home is the path that your initial Jupe specification resides in. You know? So we are going to, to build a, um, a nas.xml, and at some point to jupe run nas.xml and the path that nas.xml is located in, that is what is contained or uh, what jupe benchmark home contains uh, during the run. So, and then um, I said uh, there's something like a, or that's called a substitution set. And that is, um, uh, is defining what placeholder, and here we have the hash, MPICC hash again, which, uh, is supposed to be translated or replaced with uh, which variable or which parameter actually, yeah? So, um, and that's um, here you see, uh, you see the hash is part of the, the um, uh, placeholder definition. So you're not, not fixed on the, the hash um, placeholder. If you need, uh, need to use something else, you can use something else, but you have to make sure that you provide the, comp uh, the corresponding sub substitution set um, there. So, and when we added all of those things, um, we, did we, oh, I have to admit uh, at this part, um, we didn't look into the, um, uh, into the, um, in the step definition. So let's do that live. Um, so, and if we look, into the step definition, which we see here. Let's make that a little bit larger. Uh, so what you see in lines 33 to 37 is that we just use the, the P set, the file set, and the substitution set. And um, all of that basically then takes care of what is, uh, what is defined in there. So if we go back here, we can tube run um, and we have one step defined, which is the config step. And we'll see here, we have the step name config and we have one, um, uh, one version of this uh, configure step because we uh, didn't have any multiple uh, parameter, uh, multi-parameter value, uh, multi-value parameters in there. And so we have, Overall, one config step and that one config step is actually done. So it's not an asynchronous um, 
uh, step or has an um, asynchronous do directive in it. So it's not waiting for completion and it's also didn't produce any error. So when this is done, um, and so for this example, I set jupe work to, uh, to um, dollar temp or slash temp here. Um, and then you see that you have like the jupe, um, nice pair of benchmarks and my ID, because it was the first one, you see that uh, here as well, uh, the directory where um, it placed the, or where it created the run directory, the handle is the out path that you defined. And it also um, gives you uh, basically a hint on how to progress with this, um, with this benchmark. So and if we look into the directory, we see the configuration XML that basically is the complete selection of values and, and your um, uh, parameter sets and so on. So that is kind of copied. Um, and I, I think slightly in a slightly different format than your, um, your own configuration. Um, so it's not a direct copy of your, uh, um, uh, of your definition file, but it basically contains all included files, uh, configuration files and so on. It basically defines the full configuration of your workflow. Um, it has, um, some internal timestamps and has called run log. Sometimes it's um, uh, helpful to look into the run log. Whenever you um, uh, have, uh, if you execute jupe run or jupe continue, um, output is added to the run log and then you can check, okay, uh, if something is going wrong during your run, uh, then you can check the run log to actually see what is going wrong there. And what we see here is we have um, uh, our first step and we only have one, but it's the first one. So it gets uh, the uh, work package ID zero and it has the name config. And uh, there's a, um, a file in there that indicates that this um, step is done. And each step has a work directory. And that work directory is basically the sandbox in which that's, that specific um, work package with all the parameters and so on is executed. So uh, what we have there is our file set said, copy the make file, uh, the make dev.in from my config directory, copy it here. And then the substitution set uh, um, told you to take the make dev in, which was copied by the file set and substitute all the, tem uh, the template parameters and write the output to make.dev. Yeah. So, and uh, the work package is, is similar to the configuration uh, and XML representation of all the different work packages that are in your workflow um, and um, uh, from like start to finish. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, so uh, let's go uh, over that uh, quickly again. So the, the jupe configuration of your workflow uh, is saved in configuration um, XML and the work packages XML. Um, you have your own sandbox directory for each step um, or for each um, individual step. So if you have uh, a step that is executed with different let's say um, parameter expressions, then you, have, you might have additional work packages with a different ID here, but the same name. And we'll see how that um, uh, works out later as well. So, and then as I said, those are the generated files. And you also have in each of the work directories, you have a standard error and standard out output where dupe puts anything that um, is the output of your do directives, do directives um, in your uh, in your step. It places um, that there. Yeah. Um, for because we didn't have additional do directives, uh, both of this for this step will be empty. So now we have the config for 
the nest barrel benchmarks in general. So let's start building BT. Yeah, um, the build step um, as a requirement, we want to have the config step first. We want to have uh, the, the make.dev generated first. Um, so we need to define the build step as de uh, to depend on the config step. Um, and we also have some common infrastructure that the Nest Parallel benchmark uses for whatever benchmark you want to build. Um, well, that is in uh, Zeus and common, the common directories. And we'll see how to handle that uh, in a minute. Then each of these Nest benchmarks has build variables that are class, which defines the input size. Um, um, and classes can be W for workstation, uh, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, I think. I'm not quite sure whether it continues, could be uh, continuing depending um, on, the, uh, um, on the version of uh, the Nest pair of benchmarks you're using. And the higher the letter, yeah, um, the larger the input. And uh, nprox is also, because they're uh, quite old, the number of um, MPI processes to run this with is compiled into the application. So here, the uh, well, what you would have as um, a runtime parameter usually is actually a build time parameter. Yeah, and that is uh, um, handed to the make file via nprox. And then uh, BT is a benchmark that uh, has uh, an I/O variant in there, and that can also be that, that um, configured to be compiled into the uh, application. And uh, um, that is communicated via the subtype. One thing that you need to, to remember is uh, also when dealing with, with the nest pair benchmarks, the make target is all lowercase, and, but the subdirectory where the source is, is all uppercase. But it's basically the, the same letters as the make target. So, and then something, um, uh, so that is specific to, to the Nest pair of benchmarks and this late, uh, late, um, the last line here with the comma separated parameter values, that is specific to Ju. Um, a comma separated parameter value spans up a different, uh, like your parameter space, yeah? So uh, if you have um, uh, a parameter value that contains commas in it, Jupe will um, um, tokenize that and have each part to be a separate um, uh, um, a separate selection for your um, uh, for that parameter value. And let's look at that uh, how the parameter set for the build piece set uh, might look like. Yeah, in uh, in the line 54, you see nprox here as a comma separated list of 1, 4, 9, and 16, because um, BT likes to have square number of um, uh, processes. So what this would define is four different configurations, one with nprox being one, one with nprox being four, one with nine, one with 16. Yeah. Um, then, as I said, uh, the, the benchmark here is uh, that we want to uh, configure is BT. Um, and we use the lowercase BT uh, because then that we can use as the, um, uh, as the make target. And it'll also be the prefix for um, our binary later on. And then uh, we want to have the directory because we need that later on to kind of know how to reference the sources. And here we can use the so-called mode, different mode, um, and put Python in here. We had mode shell before as a shell expression. Here in mode Python, we can use the, uh, the benchmark as a string and then use the method upper to convert that to uppercase. Yeah. Then the class that we want to use is um, the benchmark A, but you could also have A, B, C, A, comma, B, comma, C, and that would span a new dimension in your parameter space. So um, if you would have this comma, rate, uh, comma separated list, 
and would have another common separated list, Jupe will execute this whole thing for each combination of the two. So you would have one, four, nine, and 16 end procs with A and with B and with C and so on. Yeah? So that's something that you should keep in, keep in mind. Parameter spaces with multiple comma separated lists can become big fast. So then, um, as I said, parameters are usually regarded to be kind of constant. Yeah, um, what you can, uh, you can overwrite them in the same parameter set that uh, you use them in, or um, I will say, uh, see how to use that later on when you inherit something. So what we can uh, see in line 43 is a, a default ver uh, version. If I don't have, um, uh, like it, it gets set to the empty string, so we don't have any subtype um, uh, by default. But if I want to have, uh, if the user provides the tag simple IO, I overwrite the subtype to be simple. And the same for full IO and to the same for Fortran IO. And as a later definition in this parameter set overwrites a previous definition, even if the user mistakenly put several tags of simple IO, full IO, and so on, the last one wins in this type of definition. Yeah. Okay, and then um, uh, there is um, uh, a definition or like depending on the subtype, the binary, the executable that's created has a different name. Unfortunately, the, um, uh, the, the subtype that you use is not necessarily directly um, the same as the extension that is used later on. Yeah, for example, for the simple and full, you have the MPI in there. Uh, for the Fortran, you just have the Fortran IO. And um, uh, the way I solve this here is I switch to mode Python. I define an ad hoc dictionary define the different, um, let's say, subtype values here, and then directly do a get of my subtype. And if it's not in there, um, it's gonna be empty anyway. So that way, when once I define my subtypes via the tag, the extension is automatically select, uh, selected accordingly. All right, okay. So that I think covers the whole build parameter set that we need. And, um, but we need more. Um, we need another file set where we have the common build files. Yeah? And uh, uh, we had the copy before. Um, there's also the link tag that you can use in a file set. So then it'll link to the, um, to the specific uh, file instead of copying. Uh, depending on like whether it's a large file, you might actually just want to link it. Yeah, if you have multi multiple gigabyte read-only input file, you just want to link that into your sandbox directory. So, but um, so in my benchmark home, there are the folders uh, uh, sys and common, and I want all the files, whatever is in there, even subdirectories, to be separate links inside a target directory sys and common. Um, respectively. So, and then in uh, line 62, I define a, a step now with a new name, which I call build, and then it depends on my step config. So that all the parameters that have been set in config are also available here uh, in the step build. And I can also, um, uh, and we use the build set piece, uh, the build piece set here. And that means all the parameters are evaluated right then when this step is first instantiated. And then I use the common source files, which um, will take care of all the linking that needs to be done. And now, cleverly, um, the NASPARL benchmarks has the make.dev inside the config directory. I named my 
uh, my step that generates that. Uh, I named it um, uh, after uh, uh, config as well. And the parent directory, the parent step of, um, uh, uh, of, a, of a current step is always available as a soft link um, to, to, the, uh, to the step name of the, um, of the parent. That means the parent step was called config. So the build step has a soft link inside the work directory, inside the sandbox um, that is called config. And that leads to the work directory of the parent step. So, and there I had my make.dev generated. So by defining it this way, I already have the config slash make.dev available in my build directory. So what I can also do instead of using file sets um, here as a second example, um, uh, I, in line 67, I can also do rsync, rsync or copy or anything. So personal taste, I would, I would use one of these um, ways of getting my files in there. Um, and uh, 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 these different uh, types are just here for, um, so as an example, and uh, I would consolidate the way and always work with one way of doing things. Otherwise it gets too confusing. So I also create a, um, a bin directory inside my, my, um, uh, my sandbox, my building sandbox. And then I have everything that I have the supporting files. I have um, my benchmark um, sources. Um, I have the make file, um, the top level make file. And that means I have everything complete and then I can just do a make my benchmark, which was lowercase, which is the make target of the class equals the class, the end props equals end props. And this is not the comma separated value. This is now one uh, of those four numbers. And then the subtype, which also either is empty or selected um, via, uh, via a tag. So then I have things built and I want to go um, one step further for each of my, my um, uh, variables or each of my, my executables, I want to uh, perform a measurement. So again, a new measurement, uh, a new parameter set because now I need to define a measurement uh, piece set. And here, Jupe predefines uh, sets that have a different nomenclature. Um, so uh, as he, as, uh, and, and they are predefined in a file that's called platform XML. And this platform XML is specific to a uh, um, specific job uh, or batch management system, a specific batch system. Yeah, so there's a specific platform XML for Slurm. There is uh, um, a specific um, uh, definition file platform XML for uh, PBS Pro and um, LSF and I think load level. Yeah, but it's pretty easy to write that your own if you have whatever um, uh, uh, whatever kind of submission system you have, it's pretty easy to, to create your own um, platform XML. Yeah, so, but um, for uh, the, how, it, for example, how it is integrated, um, uh, in the uh, in the Jupe module system in in Aachen, I directly put the path that has platform XML into the Jupe include path environment variable, and then Jupe knows where to find the one that is relevant for Slurm. Now, so that is something that when you install things yourself, you would have to uh, um, uh, set up manually, uh, in, um, if you're an administrator look into um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the lib directories and some subdirectories in there. At some point you get to the platform subdirectory and there you have the definitions for the different um, uh, submission systems. And then you, um, uh, you, you add the path that's relevant for your system to the jupe include path variable. So, and um, yeah, then we have a so-called uh, uh, tasks per node 
a variable which is um, a variable that is going to be um, going to be uh, uh, set in the uh, veg directory. Uh, we have a nodes um, uh, um, uh, a nodes parameter is the number of nodes. It's also part of the slurm definition. Uh, here we uh, say that this this is an integer type. Uh, this is also an integer type that we want to compute via uh, a Python expression. Uh, the same for uh, now actually this uh, mode Python that is a type that needs to uh, go because um, uh, needs to be removed because dollar uh, n prox is like twenty four. It's not an expression um, that uh, so Python. Yeah, but I tested that so. It should work as well. Okay, so and here then is uh, where we see this init width to initialize something. And uh, if you still remember, I said parameters are set once. If we don't reevaluate them uh, as an advanced um, uh, technique, yeah, they're evaluated once, and you can't overwrite them. So if you have written them in one parameter set, like in the build parameter set, you said nprox, parameter nprox uh, um, to five. And then in the build, you want to overwrite that. And it's a different parameter set, you won't allow that. So but what you can do is you can always inherit in it with. And uh, that's how this is done. The platform XML, the system parameters, basically defines what some form of sensible defaults for whatever you could put or think of in, uh, um, in a bash script. And you don't need to see, set everything explicitly. You just set everything that um, diverges from whatever sensible default was in there. So better always look into, uh, into this uh, once, check what you need to, to modify, and then in it with, and just modify what you need to modify. And what I also use, um, for example, here, I have two definitions, one for RWTH and the other, uh, the other one for FZJ, because the queue that I want to submit to is uh, different for the different systems. Yeah? In Aachen, it's C18M. In Yulish, it's the Devel queue. And, um, uh, but the other parameters are the same. So instead of copy pasting, I create a so-called uh, default PZ myself, which I initialize with the values from the platform XML. And then that stuff can be overwritten with the things that are specific to Yulish or specific to Aachen. So as I said, um, Jube um, supports asynchronous jobs. So um, uh, the user then needs to specify a so-called done file and puts a file name in there. Um, we see that in line 96 here. Yeah, um, there is in the um, parameter XML uh, and in the platform XML, um, there is already a, a parameter called done file. Yeah, um, and the default value is ready. So if you use this, you need to touch the file ready. You need to create the file ready to, um, uh, to, to actually have Jube think that this do is complete. But you could also set it to, I don't know, a checkpoint file, an output file, or whatever. Yeah, it needs to be there. And then um, uh, Jube will continue with other do's. So that is something that I, I might have to um, uh, modify in future versions of this course. Uh, because this doesn't, the, the line in um, 96 doesn't have to be the last line in your step. You can have additional do's after that. And that would make it much more, uh, much clearer that um, Jube waits for the completion, waits for the creation of this done file, and then continues with the uh, evaluation of the other do uh, directives in there. And um, so that is the, the asynchronous way of submitting a job. And we, uh, we see that the dollar submit and the dollar submit script, that's also something that is predefined in platform XML. So it'll work 
uh, um, if I have my dupe configured nicely, this configuration will work with Slurm and PBS Pro, and I won't have to update any of my, config, my, my uh, application configuration because it's part of the platform XML that is used. And then the different commands um, are updated by the higher level XML configuration. And what, what we can also see here is that the uh, platform XML also defines the so-called execution set, uh, which um, uh, takes care of parameters that are inside the batch script. So it's not the, the batch system definition. That's usually the first part of the Slurm script, for example, but like uh, the starter process, yeah, whether it's, I don't know, S run or M, uh, MPI exec or whatever, that is defined in the ex uh, execute set. Um, how, um, um, and uh, the, uh, different job, uh, the, the job files is a file set that um, copies in templates for the batch script. Those are also part of like Slurm specific, PBS Pro sp uh, specific and so on. And um, the execute sub is basically the substitution set that um, replaces uh, the parameters from the ex execute set in the batch script to actually create a specific batch job that then gets submitted um, to the submit script. Yeah, and all of that is basically predefined and you can use that already. So, and as we remember, we have 1, 4, 9, 16 in our end procs. So now we have four build process, uh, four build steps, independent of each other, siblings, and they're all done after uh, running jute run uh, nas.xml. And for each of those, we configured one measurement. So we have four build steps and four measurement steps. And those are asynchronous. So after the submit, the S batch, they're waiting for the ready file to be uh, created. And then um, uh, you would now see you'd have to do jute continue. And if you look into whatever batch system here, we have Slurm. I look uh, at the four, um, uh, at the, the queue um, under my name, and then we see that there are uh, four jobs still working in the queue. Yeah, and uh, some are actually almost complete, and uh, one is still running. So um, I would uh, run jupe continue with um, my, uh, my path and with ID zero, that is the, uh, the benchmark that is uh, running under ID. And what, I, what we see here is that one is still running and three are complete. Yeah? As an artifact, if something goes wrong um, uh, with your batch job, sometimes you don't have any jobs in the queue anymore, but they're still waiting in the system. That means something like your S run kind of sick folded or something like that, and uh, um, uh, the error couldn't be caught. Yeah, so that's where you would would you would go into the uh, into the uh, work directory and check for the job output or the job error file to to see uh, do, uh, whether that gives you an indication of what happened. All right. So and if you continue, you continue until everything is done here, and then you can go on gathering the output, yeah? So as I said, um, uh, it automates all your output gathering, yeah? Because when, when you have to, to gather things manually, that uh, becomes, um, let's say, cumbersome very quickly. Yeah, I have had, had um, thesis uh, students uh, where I said, oh, you need to remeasure. We, we did a, um, a mistake in our configuration. You have to uh, remeasure this thing. Um, and um, then you get an answer like, oh, sorry, the last time I, I remeasured everything, it took me two days to get everything into Excel. And by having this defined once, uh, you basically have this, your data in whatever format you want to process it in, um, I don't know, 30 seconds after the last job is done. Okay, so um, that's like, to me, one of the main, main um, uh, Benefits here 
um, that you can automate a lot of this cumbersome work. Yeah. All right, so if we look at the output of the BT benchmark, we see lots of stuff and some of that we want to want to grab into a pattern. Yeah, um, so the, uh, for example, the, the epsilon setting, um, that might be an interesting value to have um, if that might be something for, for my application. Um, here, the, the class we already defined as the class. So we already have a parameter here. So if you would want to grab this, via regular expression, um, you could compare that and do a verification, an automatic verification say, well, is the class that was actually executed um, the same as the one that I uh, configured? But usually um, you wouldn't have to have to do that. Um, in, in the, let's say, uh, once you're done configuring your, uh, um, your jupe specification, yeah, because once it's running, once it doesn't contain any errors, class A will always be A when you configure A. All right, and then you have some iterations and you would have, for example, the time in seconds and so on. Yeah, and you would, for example, here, it does some internal uh, checking and it tells you whether the verification of the benchmark result, um, result uh, was successful or not. So then you usually, I don't know, copy paste that into uh, um, a definition here, and then you kind of boil that down to a regular expression that um, uh, uh, matches what you want to have. And there you again have predefined variables, for example, the jupe underscore pat for pattern underscore fp for floating point. And the floating point, um, that basically matches any, any way you think you could write um, uh, um, a floating point. So it has uh, the, uh, it matches integers because that's a special form of a floating point. It matches um, uh, one dot and nothing behind it. It matches one dot, no matter how many numbers come after that, it um, matches scientific no notation with capital E, lowercase e, with uh, minus uh, multiple digits in the uh, exponent, uh, plus minus in, in, um, at the beginning of the, the number and so on. Yeah, so that basically, you should always, if you want to match a number, use that pattern. Um, so you can have FP for floating point, but you can also have underscore int for an integer, and then match exactly uh, the integer. Um, but you can also define your own kind of regular expressions um, to kind of match what you want to match. And all these patterns are, are uh, basically applied to each line. So um, uh, you need to make sure that you don't have any ambiguous definitions. They will overwrite each other. Also something, Um, also something that uh, um, is, uh, um, uh, uh, th that you should consider is you can only have one matching definition. And this jupe pattern here already has the, um, the uh, parentheses that you see in line uh, 101 and 102 added manually. The jupe pattern um, underscore int and underscore fp have those already in there. Yeah, so that would match a floating point. And then that floating point would be the only contents of epsilon. Yeah, and you can only have one matching on one of those, uh, on the line for a pattern. Yeah, so if you have multiple numbers in one line, you have to specify uh, match only the third number. And so can use the complex pattern for floating points again. There are also patterns called NFP and NINT, and then uh, those were non-matching. Okay, that's something to, to keep in mind uh, when you uh, look at that, but they, you, uh, when you write your own configurations, but you can also um, uh, look into that um, uh, when you check out the documentation. So, and then the analyzer, once you have the pattern sets, uh, set, yeah, the analyzer is pretty easy. You just use the pattern set and then you say, well, I want to analyze the step measurement 
And there I have a file, and it's the here it's a log out file, which is job.out by default, defined in platform XML. And then it'll apply the patterns to the job.out. Yeah, in the sandbox file for the measurement um, for the measurement step. So what you can also do is um, uh, you uh, in, instead of having a global pattern file, you can directly uh, use a specific pattern um, set to uh, one output file. In, in case you have these uh, different definitions uh, in there, uh, and that that might conflict with um, different files. Yeah, like the same definitions for different files. What you need to keep in mind, though, is that you need um, uh, unique names for your patterns. So unfortunately, if you have a, a similar pattern, uh, but you want to have different variables, like because it needs um, uh, needs to be in different um, columns of your result table, then um, you need to define individual patterns for that. So um, then, uh, um, yeah, you put that together by using the analyzer and uh, defining a result table as well. Uh, the result table is um, uh, uh, you use the analyzer. Yeah, so you have kind of this hierarchy. The, the uh, analyzer uses uh, the patterns files and the result table uses the analyzer. And then you have um, uh, defined a basic um, Info. So sorry. Um, okay. So um, then you define the table um, uh, and you give it a basic name, which is the prefix of a file, um, like basic info dot dot, and the style here is pretty, and I sort my tables with. Um, according to the benchmark column, the class column, and the endprox column. And the, these five columns are supposed to be my info. And usually what I do, I pretty print information that I want to visually check whether the benchmark was okay. So for example, like the verification output, I want that the, I want the successful to be um, parsed correctly. Uh, and see that everything was successful, but I don't necessarily need the successful as part of my CSV file because I don't want to plot it. Yeah, so you can define different tables there. And this is how things would uh, look that way. And uh, I also defined it was, it's in the XML file that you will um, get um, the basic CSV uh, that just has the, um, the four columns of the, uh, the total time and it doesn't have the verification. So this here, I visually can directly see how everything went well. I can use the numbers and uh, then I have the CSV file that I can import into uh, my post-processing tool. All right, so uh, we're almost at the end, also at the, at, uh, almost at the end of the time. So, um, but then usually when you want to perform measurements, there, there's some, um, I'd say, uh, variance in there. And you need to do multiple, uh, multiple, um, uh, multiple measurements. So what you do is your measurement step. You just say uh, you just state that you want to have multiple iterations. For example, here five. So then it will automatically create five different sandboxes for each of these measurement steps and perform the same configuration, the same parameter set for five. Um, specific configurations of the measurement step that you had earlier, yeah? And now, um, uh, Jube also provides rudimentary statistics like uh, the counts um, of how many uh, times um, uh, uh, a certain pattern uh, matched. Um, the, um, like th that usually, the, the count here should usually be the number of iterations that you have there. Um, and uh, but that helps you on like later if you have the result table to see which iterations are already done and which are still missing. Then you have a minimum, the average, the uh, standard deviation, and the maximum. Um, 
And uh, there are also some, some others, uh, but these are usually the ones that I use and then you can uh, easily plot error mass uh, with those. Yeah, and uh, once that is, uh, that is done, you just uh, jube run um, uh, with your, and actually this should have been NAS iter here uh, at the top. And it automatically adds five iterations for each of your four jobs. So now you have 20 measurement steps. And here you probably start to see why this is, uh, uh, starts saving you time if you need to do a lot of measurements. Yeah. Um, all right. And uh, basically the rest is lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, you continue until everything's done. You analyze your result. And at some point uh, you have everything uh, output as, um, as you see here. Yeah. Um, so these values here are so-called reductions. That is uh, a feature of the analyzer um, that has an attribute where you say reduce equals true, which is the default, but you can also say reduce equals false. And then you wouldn't get um, the, uh, um, the total time um, as uh, individual um, values for each iteration. And then you can do your statistical analysis however you want it on your own, yeah? So if Jupe doesn't provide the, the right information. Okay, so as a summary, um, Jupe helps you automate your recurring workflows coming from benchmarking or running performance measurements, yeah? Uh, but you can also uh, um, think of different workflows that you might want to, want to uh, automate. So I also started um, or thinking about using Jupe to just build software. Um, and we, we use it for uh, regression testing as well. Um, you can uh, have automated parameter sweeps if you have multiple comma separated parameters um, that spans up the parameter space. And um, uh, each of the step is, is sandboxed. Right? So you don't overwrite stuff uh, depending on different uh, like configurations. And it provides templates for the most common resource managers. Um, and uh, um, yeah, it provides the infrastructure for you to easily parse uh, um, the output via regular expressions. And then you can um, yeah, conveniently kind of wrap everything up into either a CSV file or some pretty printed uh, text file. 